Yeah. You're good. You can move. Well, I'm gonna call you out when you come back. Yeah, no. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Financial Services Roundtable. My name is Anthony Semino, and I'm Head of Government Affairs here at FSR. I really do want to thank you all for coming today. We've got a great event, but more importantly, I want to thank you all for the partners and leaders in this room working so importantly and focused on financial literacy. We're here today to recognize National Financial Capability Month and trying to identify what success is, how to measure it, and how to grow it. And for such a broad and ambitious topic, success can mean different things to different people. But at its core, it's about informing and empowering individuals to make better financial decisions, whether that's accessing financial services and products for the first time, whether that's a checking or savings account, saving for college, a home, or retirement. It's all about empowerment. And so many people in this room are working to further that end. So we've got a great program here to drive that discussion forward. Shortly, we're going to bring up US Treasurer Jovita Carranza. And she's going to talk a little bit about her initiatives and what she's been working on. Shortly following that, we're going to hear from Joe Thomas at Junior Achievement to talk about what the message they're bringing to folks of all ages and helping arm them with the tools for this. And then we're following that, we're going to have a panel of experts and practitioners from some of the key companies in this space, including KeyBank, SunTrust, and Visa. But before we do that, I want to bring up one of my colleagues here who has been tireless in her efforts on this both working at the Treasury Department and the private sector, and a real voice and driver here at FSR. If you'd all please welcome Judy Chaffa to the stage. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, all of you, for joining us here today. It is my pleasure to once again host with FSR and my colleagues the celebration of Financial Capability Month, Financial Literacy Month, Financial Wellness whatever we are calling it today. Uh, I find it all inclusive of all of those titles. It is definitely my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, it was a, a delight when I received the call from her personally yesterday that she was able to join us. Uh, the US Treasurer of the United States, Jovita Carranza, serves as the principal advisor to Secretary Mnuchin. Her primary focus is to increase participation in the vibrant U.S. economy by fostering financial capability and sustainability. Treasurer Carranza oversees the Office of Consumer Policy, which provides policy, leadership, research, and analysis in these areas, and coordinates the integration of the Financial Literacy and Financial Education Commission, FLEC. Most of you in this room have either heard of it, are on it, or, or have worked with it. And she's also the chair on behalf of Secretary Mnuchin. She serves as the Secretary of the Treasury's designee on the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund Community Development Advisory Board, which is a mouthful, I know, but that's basically the CDFI Fund Advisory Board. And I have the distinct pleasure of serving with her in, on that board as well. And if that wasn't enough, wait, there's more. <laughs> Treasurer Carranza, who has a very busy schedule, just already I'm exhausted from that first half, but um, that's why I'm really excited to have her here with us. She also maintains the historic role of advising the Secretary on matters relating to coinage produced by the U.S. Mint. She has oversight responsibilities for all the operations of the U.S. Mint, including Fort Knox. She is a Chicago nati native and previously served as Deputy Administrator for the SBA under President George W. Bush. <coughs> and previous, sh prior to that, she had a distinguished career. We won't say how many years because women don't talk about other women's <laughs> n years. Uh, there you go. Uh, at UPS. 
She has numerous philanthropic activities and serves on several boards, including, and I'm just going to name a few here, uh, the American Cancer Society, Corporate Advisory Board, U.S. Global Leadership Council, uh, and U.S. Business Administration Service Corp of Retired Executives. Please join me in welcoming U.S. Treasurer Jovita Carranza. I'm glad you left me some time to give my presentation. Um, that that uh, resume usually ages me, but uh, I did it all in a very compacted uh, time frame. So thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And um, to uh, address the audience, I'd like to say that it's really an honor and a privilege to serve you as the U.S. Treasurer. And more importantly, it's really an honor to be here as a guest at the Financial um, Services Roundtable. I had to do some research before um, preparing, and uh, I got the approval. Judy, I reached out for Judy um, yesterday and said, oh, by the way, I I'm personally confirming that I'll be attending, and she um, indicated she was not aware that I had to confirm, but we've been working on this for a few, few weeks already, Judy. Um, on behalf of uh, Treasury, the secre tre Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, excuse me, and the entire Treasury team, uh, we appreciate this invitation to speak to you all. It is one of the highest priorities of this administration and the Treasury Department to promote economic growth across America. However, as we continue to expand economic opportunity, it's also important to recognize the importance of financial literacy and education in, in helping people maintain prosperity. Unfortunately, many individuals and families lack the core skills needed for making vital financial decisions such as buying a home, starting a business, or even helping their children with decisions about student loans. And too many people are not certain where to start with uh, planning or saving for retirement. In order to succeed, consumers need to be skilled at financial decision making and possess financial know-how. They need access to basic information and financial education that can help them develop these vital skills. It's also important that government and the private sector support and provide financial literacy and education that reflect the best practices for effective and impactful programs. Treasury is supportive of impactful financial education because the health of our nation, nation's economy depends on it. Our economy is rooted in the financial well-being of individual consumers and households. As President Trump has noted, the ability of Americans to plan, save, and invest is vital to their building wealth and pursuing the American dream. Today I'd like to talk about some of the work Treasury is doing with respect to financial literacy and education, as well as how Treasury's recent recommendations on the Community Reinvestment Act can be used to support increased financial capability for low and moderate income families and communities. The Treasury Department's financial literacy and education efforts are coordinated by the Financial Literacy and Education Commission, FLEC. And I learned at the four first CDFI meeting that Judy Chapa was one of its founders, if not its innovator. So I applaud your work, Judy. The FLEC, comprising 23 federal government entities, has its primary purpose to improve the financial literacy and education of persons in the United States through the development of a national strategy to promote financial literacy and education. The FLEC plays a central role in the federal government's efforts to enhance financial well-being for all Americans and has among its responsibilities the development of financial education programs and curricula. The FLEC is chaired by the Secretary of the Treasury and the Vice Chair is the Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The Commission is coordinated by Treasury's Office of Consumer Policy in the Office of the U.S. Treasurer. So in addition to all of the um, oversights that Judy has mentioned, Upon arriving to the Treasury, the Secretary also assigned the Office of Consumer Policy uh, eight federal career uh, executives that have been exceptional 
in their work with financial literacy and also um, with CRA. Historically, the flex role has been as an important sharing forum for member agencies with the goal of strengthening coordination among the agencies where possible. However, a large number of federal agencies administer programs and produce materials on financial education topics, many of which have not been assessed for effectiveness and may have ineffective overlapping and potentially duplicative uses of resources. The FLEC agencies annual, annually invest a significant amount of time and money on financial literacy and education programs for individuals and households. However, only a few of the FLEC agencies have metrics for determining the effectiveness and impact of these programs. With this type of investment, the administration believes it's essential that we assess the availability, utilization, and impact of these federal programs. Recently, Treasury launched a FLEC reform initiative to ensure that the FLEC goes beyond information sharing to supporting and coordinating effective and impactful federal financial literacy and education programs. The FLEC reform process will include the following. Identification and removal of activities that are duplicative. Identification of best practices and removal of activities that are not effective or impactful. Development of a financial literacy and education curriculum. Development of FLEC governance structure that helps the FLEC achieve its mission. Treasury has formed a steering committee to get input on reform from the FLEC agencies and has formed working groups that will begin meeting with stakeholders and experts like you on financial literacy from the public and the private sector. With respect to impacts, Treasury intends to use this reform process to develop best practices for financial education based on measurements of learning outcomes and end game results. Learning outcomes measure how much knowledge participants are acquiring from the financial literacy and education programs, while end game results measure changes in behavior that lead to greater financial capability. There are many financial literacy and education programs that measure learning outcomes by testing a consumer's pre-course and post-course understanding of the material. However, there are few programs that actually test changes in behavior. This distinction is important because the research indicates that positive learning outcomes don't always translate into long-term changes in behavior. Treasury recognizes that more work needs to be done by the FLEC agencies to measure end game outcomes and that randomized controlled trials, RCTs as known in the, in the industry, often produce the highest standard of evidence about an intervention's effectiveness. Randomized controlled trials, trials excuse me, select individuals from the same population and randomly assign them to either the experimental group or controlled group. At the end of the trial, any differences in outcomes between the two groups observed after the intervention can be attributed to the intervention. In other words, the control group is the counterfactual for the researchers to understand what would have happened to the experimental group without the intervention. However, these randomized control trials can take many years and cost millions of dollars. The FLEC reform process wants to look into ways that we can partner among federal agencies as well as with the private sectors to be more cost effective and timely with these studies because they are crucial to determining the best practices for impactful financial literacy and education. Finally, I should say that the issues that I have highlighted here do not, re do not represent a comprehensive list of the issues we are reviewing as part of the FLEC reform. Our continued research will likely lead to additional avenues to explore. 
Our stakeholder meetings will continue throughout this FLEC reform process and we look forward to speaking with many of you over the next three to four months. Treasury is excited about this work and anticipates providing draft recommendations in the fall of this year. Although the federal government plays a role in supporting and advancing financial literacy for American households, Treasury does not underestimate the importance of the role played by the private sector. As many of you are aware, Treasury recently provided recommendations to the banking regula regulators to modernize the Community Reinvestment Act, which included a recommended change to the service test that would incentivize banks to provide more support for financial education. Activities that build low to modern income consumers' financial capability are widely recognized as CRA eligible under the service test as either a retail or community development service. But a bank's physical presence, that is, its branch network and deposit bank, uh, bank excuse me, deposit taking a ATMs, continues to be the key focus for regulators under the service test. In our CRA recommendations, Treasury recommended that regulators focus on the utilization and impact of services rather than the vehicle for delivering the services when assessing eligibility for CRA credit. This has the potential to open the door for banks to receive more credit for financial literacy and education activities. We also recommend that the CRA regulators continue to work with the FLEC to develop guidance and resources to enable banks to implement research-based strategies into their financial education activities that include measurements of effectiveness. These recommended regulatory steps are similar to the work we will be pursuing during the FLEC reform process. Banks should be encouraged to partner with and invest in professional experts. That's a given. But it's crucial that FLEC work with the regulators to develop best practices for these partners to ensure that the financial education is effective and impactful for low to moderate income communities. The Department of Treasury and the administration are committed to promoting economic prosperity in urban and rural areas across the country, and especially in the communities you serve. Your ability to leverage resources, to facilitate public-private partnerships, and your persistent attention to financial literacy and education is key to that mission. We look forward to continue to work together to ensure that individuals, families, and communities have what they need in order to prosper in the long term and pursue the American dream. Thank you very much. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for that comment. Because it was such a successful uh, process, the CRA reform, where we engage the community, the private sector, public, non-for-profit, and um, encourage their recommendations as well uh, before developing the uh, entire strategy, we are also following the same process for the Financial Literacy and Education uh, Commission reform. OMB is very much engaged and very supportive of the process, and so I think uh, we'll see some great gains in that in that process. So thank you very much for your comments. Yes. Uh, my name is Dan from Johns Hopkins. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, in your request. You have a lot of improvements in there to the budget program and stuff. And I strongly desire uh, not to take the old law away, but to bring back the new law so that I can see it. Because I saw the old law. 
Well, we have not ruled out any population um, because we also have a population that have has retired early and are transitioning into becoming entrepreneurs or uh, or other fields, um, not board members on non-for-profits and whatnot. So uh, we definitely have kept that population in mind um, uh, when we incorporate the rural, the urban, the K to 12, the youth, millennials, also veterans. Um, we have a very, very uh, deep focus in the area of the military service people uh, because they're in great need as well. So we've covered all bases, but thank you for that concern. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Well, in our research, we've discovered that many of the agencies have contracted certain vendors to do studies, including the Treasury. And so um, they come in all shapes and forms. They're educators. Um, we do studies at the universities. We also do the financial consultants. They have small businesses that provide uh, consultation. So they're fully vetted following the pro uh, federal procurement uh, requirements or compliance. And so to tell you specifically who they are, I wouldn't be able to tell you that. Uh, to tell you how much we've spent, that we definitely can cover that, uh, not at this meeting, but in other meetings. Um, so the, the fact that we've spent millions and, and every agency has contracted in some form or fashion experts to study this area uh, says that there's an opportunity to c continue the engagement but perhaps qualify those that have participated. But thank you for your comment. Thank you. Everybody, please please join me in thanking Treasurer Ramon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's an interesting comment, and I can um, state very factually because I have been engaged with the White House on the SBA uh, website and information platform reform. They're actually um, enhancing the content. The Treasury is uh, developing some content on business finance because they're realizing that um, web websites, webinars, conferences, seminars, all of the tools that they have provided when we call um, startups, gazelles, and, and others, uh, we're, they're addressing the growth p potential of each one of those um, uh, types of or sectors of small business. But the entrepreneur is very active. Uh, there's about a six to eight member committee looking at that currently. The micro loan level, as well as those that are already in a million dollar <coughs> revenue stream and just poised for growth. Because our administration is totally focused on strengthening our economy through job creation and wage growth. And that's really the mantra and the, the focus that we have. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we started off very strong. And as you can see, the administration is very focused not only on achieving this outcome, but methodically and systematically addressing it to achieve some of these successful goals here. And our next speaker is actually going to be a very valuable resource in that discussion and our focus here on achieving success. He is Dr. Joe Thomas from Junior Achievement, Vice President for Research and Evaluation, and he has a very rich background in business and academic circles on understanding the methods, understanding and assessing different programs, I think it's going to bring a very valuable expertise to what we're talking about here, what's working, and how we can continue to push forward this dialogue. With that, Dr. Joe Thomas. Uh, 
I was, as an evaluator, I was particularly excited to hear about some of the things that Treasury has planned for all of us. In particular, the rigor that they're going into to introduce into impact measurement over the next couple of years. Uh, controlled randomized studies, for example, very difficult to do, very challenging, as uh, Madam Secretary mentioned, uh, uh, Madam Treasurer mentioned. Uh, very expensive, takes a long time. For many of us, though, we live in the real world who have an obligation to provide impact information and feedback to our stakeholders and our constituents, we deal with a slightly different problem. Evaluation of financial literacy programs is relatively easy to do. Uh, the fact is there are really only two models of evaluation that many of us use or some variation of those. What I'd like to do is I'd like to try to convince you there's a third model that uh, hasn't seen too much of the light of day that we should be thinking about that we can immediately, immediately apply and start using right away to start measuring impact in a meaningful way. It's not equivalent with, uh, with CRTs, to be sure, but it's still very, very effective. In fact, I would submit to you that it's probably one of the most effective, important, and focused ways of doing evaluation for financial literacy programs, financial competency programs, final, financial education programs, whatever we choose to call it. Um, let me start with the first two models. The first two models you'll recognize almost immediately, probably by your own terms, but you'll recognize the elements of each. The first model we typically use is a change model, right? And that change model asks the question, have our students increased their knowledge, their behaviors, or changed their behaviors, or increased their positive behaviors about financial literacy after participating in a program? As you just heard, Typically what we do is we do pre and post test and ostensibly the difference between the pre and post test on knowledge or attitude is a measure of impact. And it's an important measure of impact as, as well. It shouldn't be dismissed so easily. Um, the second model of evaluation is typically considered the mastery model. The mastery model asks a very simple but fundamental question. It asks, have our students achieved an expected level of understanding or a threshold of understanding, say for example in knowledge, financial literacy knowledge, positive attitudes again about financial literacy, or perhaps even uh, changing their behaviors. Uh, the mastery model doesn't care what a student knows or doesn't know before the program. They just care what they know when they leave the program. You could, uh, you could arguably say that the U.S. education system is comparable in that respect, right? We do testing every year. What we're really interested in is What's the level of mastery of a specific level of education at the end of the year? Both of those models are essential and they're important and they provide stakeholders incredibly important information about the impact of our programs. We can very specifically measure, many of you do, like we do it at JA, we can specifically say knowledge base has changed, attitudes have changed, and the students, if we're not doing longitudinal studies because we know how challenging those are, we know that students claim or say they intend to change the behavior based on what they know and how they feel about what they know. Any good change theory basically says those three things. If you change the fund of knowledge and you can measure reliably that attitudes change as a function of that and students claim they intend or your stakeholders, whoever they may be, claim they, that they intend to change your behavior then social research predicts that, in fact, many of them will. You don't need a CRT to prove that. There's enough social science research over the last 40 years to demonstrate that. It's not the same, mind you, but it's awfully good. Now, what's that third model that I suggest that I'm going to try to convince you of the value of? It's this. What if? What if we could combine the delivery of our content with the assessment as it's taking place. In other words, we make it simultaneous. Now, what does this look like? Well, what this means then is we've created a diagnostic model. And rather than asking questions about change or mastery, what we're now asking is specifically, what does a student know or what does a student not know? And what information or what content, what knowledge or what attitudes do we have to offer that student in real time. This could be considered uh, using terminology familiar to evaluators as a personalized adaptive assessment method. 
the reason it's so radical, and it would, it would really take a lot for us to make this, this shift mentally to this kind of model, is this. You think about the mastery and the change model, they're knowledge base centered. We start with a base of knowledge, we're fond of knowledge, and we say, we want our students to achieve some modicum of uh, evidence that in fact they have this knowledge or they have this, this information. An adaptive assessment method would do something different. It would make it the model, the evaluation model, entirely student-based. This is different. By focusing on the student, you're now shifting the assessment type. You're also shifting the experience that the student would have. What would the student experience be? Well, I can tell you this. The student would instantly recognize when taking part in an assessment like this that this, the assessment was focused on their unique learning needs. The assessment would be efficient. The student wouldn't be asked, or the participant in the program wouldn't be asked irrelevant questions over and over and over again, because we do that often in evaluation. We try to ask questions in different ways to try to triangulate in on what our students know. But the biggest difference of all, I think, was that it would turn this assessment into an interview. And the student would know that, they would feel that. It would be a different assessment experience. Is this kind of thing feasible in the evaluation field? Well, absolutely, I would say. We have been modeling in the evaluation discipline this approach for nearly 20 years. I would say the best example is the US military. About 20, 25 years ago, they adopted the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, an adaptive assessment. It gave them more information in a shorter amount of time and in a more efficient way than any other testing method prior to that. Uh, State Departments of Transportation have been using a, a form of assessment met methodology that's adaptive for their driver's test for a number of years now. So in fact, it started in the state of Maryland, if I'm not mistaken. And even the medical field now is now asking us for help in designing adaptive interviews so they can develop reliable and credible diagnostics that are more efficient than anything we currently have. Imagine, imagine students who know that we're invested in their financial well-being, who know that we have the content that they need. They've heard it either at school, they've heard it from, from various places, and they understand intrinsically that they need that information. Imagine creating a learning scenario where we're combining the delivery with the assessment and the student feels different about it. It's no longer a test. It's not even a survey. It's an interview about what the students know. We have the psychometrics for it now. We have the technology for, for this now. We're even practicing doing it right now. In lieu of doing CRTs, which all of us need to be doing, uh, and we need to be do doing longitudinal studies for those of us that currently work in a world where our donors and our stakeholders are asking for instant information about what we're doing. We have that. But I think to incentivize students to understand the value of some of the information that we're trying to provide them because they have no context for it, we need to be rethinking the assessment model. Again, we have the technology. What we need is a radical shift in the way evaluators like us think about it. This new generation of learners and, and they were alluded to earlier today, this new generation of learners is experiencing this in the classroom already. They expect us to do something new, but more importantly, I think they demand it. And if their expectations aren't met in how we blend our technology and our assessment, our learning delivery, we're gonna lose them. So now's the time for us to be collectively thinking about that. We have solid models, we have a new model, I think we should be trying all of them and then comparing them. And then hopefully all benefit from the work that the Treasury is doing as well with those uh, randomized control tile, uh, trials. I'm looking forward to that myself. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And incredibly fascinating stuff and clear how rigorous we need to be in reassessing what's working and what's not. And then when you also think about what the treasurer said about not underestimating the role of the private sector, I think our next panel is going to be particularly helpful on that front. We have three great leaders and participants on this. First, we have Don Graves, incoming head of corporate responsibility and community relations at KeyBank. He is senior vice president and senior director, and he creates integrated strategy between community outreach efforts and public officials, community groups, and agencies that support KeyBank's line of business, as well as the opportunities and commitments of KeyBank's five-year, $16.5 billion national community benefits plan. Second with us, we have Ms. Krista Massey, Senior VP of Marketing Activation at SunTrust Bank. For over 10 years, she has distinguished herself by creating consistent and strategic approaches to marketing activation, sponsorship, and community involvement, leading such things as the SunTrust Park Project, building partnerships with the historic Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, and the Atlanta, Fal Atlanta Fal Falcons, excuse me, the Volvo Cars Open, and several college and community universities. And then lastly, we have Mr. Hugh Norton, head of U.S. financial education at Visa. Hugh is the head of U.S. financial education and includes the award-winning practical money skills for life, Veterans Financial Coalition, and What's My Score programs. He's been an active participant and leader in financial literacy community for years. And then, of course, to my immediate left, we have our own leader, Lou Tappa. So with that, let me actually just remind folks, at the end of this, we will likely open for Q&A. Please wait for the mic runner to come to you with the mic so it can be picked up on the live feed. Thank you all. With that, Judy. Thank you again, Anthony. As uh, Treasurer Carranza noted um, through her remarks, um, Treasury has really stepped up. I'm very excited about the whole concept of measuring metrics and finding out what works, what doesn't work, and actually getting rid of those things that aren't making an impact. Uh, as all of you in this room who work in financial education know, there are literally hundreds of thousands of programs out there, and the creation of more programs is probably not anything that needs to be done at this point, but rather evaluation and measurement for duplication of those efforts that are making an impact. There are many ways to help consumers of all ages across various segments uh, become more financially literate, and as I look around the room, that is what all of you are doing in your day in and day out lives, and some of you, like myself, have been doing it for a couple of years. I'm not going to go into too many years as specific. specific. Um, I'm like the treasurer. I don't go past 10. Um, but there are very many different ways. Uh, you can become financially literate and capable from interactive games to in-person classes, online platforms, or hands-on learning. We just heard how Junior Achievement is measuring results, and we have the experts here to my left uh, to tell us what, how they are uh, measuring their impact of their individual corporate programs on financial education. So without further ado, let's get started. So I'll start with Don. Don, uh, you guys, uh, Key Bank in Towson, Texas, uh, currently, uh, recently rather, acquired Hello Wallace. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that program and how you are currently measuring the impact and how that customers are utilizing that for financial education? Thanks, Judy. Uh, thank you first for uh, having us here and putting on this, uh, this conversation because I think it's critically important. Um, when, you, when we think about financial fitness, financial wellness, um, we think about, uh, think about it from a client centricity perspective, uh, uh, perspective of how can we make sure that we're providing clients with everything they need to be successful. And a few years ago, we decided it would be best for us to do a study and do a little bit of research to better understand and assess where our clients were and where they thought they were going. It turned out that, that uh, the study, and we did uh, several thousand people were part of this study, so it was a fairly large study. 55% um, of uh, those surveyed said that they were not confident about their, uh, their, financial, their financial future. 
So 50, if 55% of the people that we were able to study who are, who were our clients are not confident about their future, you can imagine what that means for, uh, for Americans as a whole. More than 70% wanted to take action on their financial future. Most of them didn't know how to do that. So we said, let's take a step back and think about a way that we can get to a place where we're actually doing all the things that, that Joe talked about, where, where we can get to a place where we're actually having an impact on people, but in a way that, that meets them where they are rather than uh, where, where we were. So uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of uh, the, the great work that Hello Wallet uh, had done. Uh, uh, Matt Fellows from Brookings Institution uh, had built out a platform that was really innovative uh, and provided the type of financial literacy, financial capability that we thought was, was the right partner for us. They lacked a large financial institution and its client base, and we had three million or so clients across the country, banking clients, so it, it was the perfect partnership. And we decided that we were going to build this connection between uh, Key Bank and Hello Wallet, and frankly, embed Hello Wallet in everything that we do. Uh, we, d we said, we're, we're gonna bet the house on financial wellness, because if our clients are successful, if our clients are financially fit and understand how to control their fu financial future, then they're going to be very they're going to be successful clients, and we can be there to help them all along the way. So that was really the reason that we decided to 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 bring Hello Wallet on, and it's it's been a fantastic partnership so far. So Chris, SunTrust launched a financial wellness movement to over three million participants. Uh, very successful. I know your CEO had a lot of personal involvement, ha very hands on, mm -hmm. and it was the on up. Um, what metrics has SunTrust uh, used to help measure the impact that it's had with your personal involvement? Okay. And, and employees, because it's both Absolutely. and internal. Absolutely. Um, we've talked a lot today about uh, the importance of financial confidence and the importance of the behaviors that come with that. So the ONIT movement was launched two years ago with a goal of reaching 5 million people over five years to help them take a step towards financial confidence. Because we believe once you take the first step, then you can be on that path to making real change. Um, so obviously one of the biggest measures we use is the fact that today, I looked this morning when I got on the plane in Atlanta, um, over 3.1 and some change million people have taken a step towards financial confidence. And for anybody keeping score, that's two years' time, so we're ahead of where we thought we would be right now. So we're very excited about that. But I think the root of the ONET movement came from, much like you just said, we, we assumed that people in our company, our teammates in our company, who had access to you know things that a lot of other people don't, would be financially confident. And when we surveyed our teammates, we found out that only 40% of them were. So we launched a financial wellness program where we were asking them to save $2,000 for an emergency. And we matched that um, once, once our teammates went through a series of training and certain exercises to help change their behavior. We matched um, up to $1,000 for each 1000 put in so that you could reach that, that $2,000 magic number that I think a lot of us in the industry talk about. Um, we knew that that would help them if they were financially confident. It would help them see where our clients also needed support to become financially confident. What I'm not sure we really understood is the impact that it would have on, on their personal lives. Um, our engagement is at an all-time high at SunTrust. Our turnover has gone down dramatically, most dramatically in the teller base, which obviously is one of the highest turnover within the industry. So our teammates feel good about our company because they feel good about themselves and they feel as though we have helped them um, put them on the path to financial confidence. So those are kind of the biggest metrics we look at right now. We have some others that we're still studying, but when you see what it does to your company internally and you see how fast it resonates with the general public, you know, the ONET movement is not for our clients, it's for everyone. And so we have people who have joined the ONET movement or taken a step towards financial confidence in every state in the country, even though we're predominantly in our retail presence in the southeast.
and I'll use the mic this time. Sorry for those of you that may have been watching online. I forgot to pull up the mic last question. Thank you, Anthony, for the gentle in the audience reminder. Kind of blew that for everybody now. So, Hugh, uh, Visa's Practical Money Skills Program uh, engages consumers to teach them to be more responsible about their money, spending habits, learning how to save, especially the younger generation. Can you tell us uh, a little bit more about the program and how you track any type of significant changes and, or metrics that you use? Sure, yeah, I'd love to. Um, and, you know, let me echo my fellow panelists in saying thank you so much to, to have us all here. This is, you know, uh, really, I think, a fantastic opportunity to get together to, to share ideas. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think first off, you know, when, whenever, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure this is, this is, you know, very true of, uh, of uh, many of us in the room, but when, when we first endeavor to, to sort of start a program, uh, any of the educational materials we have, whether it's, you know, the, from the NFL resource to, you know, e even just sort of our, you know, the simple pamphlets that might be for, you know, retirees or basics of debit, um, we listen. Uh, so, I mean, we work with educators, we work with uh, legislators, and, and we listen to, you know, what works, what would, what would they like to see, which populations, um, you know, uh, where are, you know, the, the pain spots, where are the most helpful places for these things, and these change over the years, as, as you know, as all of us know. Um, you know, obviously, we, we look to measure the, the reach of the program. Uh, our program is a global program, so we have uh, what is 17 different uh, websites in 17 languages. Um, we receive around uh, 100 million um, uh, page views a year. Um, uh, the, you know, the, from our most popular global resource, uh, Financial Soccer, which has been played over 11 million times, to, um, you know, the Financial Football, which here in the U.S. has been played 2 million times. Um, you know, so there's engagement there. But, you know, I, I think as, as we've all sort of talked about, you know, it has to be, it has to be more than engagement. Um, and education is good, so doing, uh, you know, obviously with, with any new program that we've launched, we're, you know, testing with, you know, pre and post and measuring the effectiveness of that and, it, you know, is the learning getting across? Um, and, and that's, you know, th that's obviously important. Um, but, you know, one of the, one of the things I think that's, that's difficult, one of the things that, that can be a big challenge, and I mean, it's sort of the, the unicorn, which, you know, we all talk about is, is actually measuring that behavioral change. How do we measure the behavioral change? How do we actually track the fact that we're, we're changing behaviors? And, and just because, I, I would also say, you know, just because a resource is not designed specifically to affect behavioral ch change does not mean that it's not necessarily a worthwhile resource. That you might have a resource which is just designed to engage and, and create interest in and introduce uh, somebody to the world of finance that, that wouldn't necessarily be designed just for your behavioral change, um, and that's still an effective resource. So I mean, I think I think there's it's it's good to good to keep in mind that there's there's many different goals and there's many different successful. Uh, it looks like success with you know many different things, but so um, you know one of the one of the games that we're currently working on, we we choose gamification as as a way of you you know I I engaging. Um, uh, you know, our, our constituents and, you know, whether that's, um, you know, consumers or, you know, whether that's working with uh, uh, elected officials or working with our issuers. Um, we like, uh, you know, we have many different types of tools, but I think we're, we're most known for gamification. And one of the gaming tools that we've actually started to develop is, is, uh, is something which is focused on um, hopefully contextualizing that education and affecting real behavioral change. And one of the things um, that, that our esteemed speaker from, from Junior uh, Achievement was talking about was sort of that, you know, in, engaging at the, at, the, at the time of education to sort of understand exactly where the educational points are and, you know, wh maybe where some of those blind spots are. So one of the things that, that this specific resource is designed to help teachers do, at the time the, kid, the students are playing the game, they're gonna have uh, a, a way of actually seeing how students are progressing through the game uh, you know what they're doing, where their pain points are, and, and so they can actually respond immediately, um, you know, in, in, in an educational sense. Now, what this resource, which, how it's different from you know many of the other things that we have, 
is that it, it's designed to put the players, to put the students into an environment, in a video game environment, but into an environment where they're having to make multiple decisions at, a, at exactly the same time um, due to multiple inputs at exactly the same time. And those inputs, they may be good, they may be bad, they have to assess them. So whether it's you know, a, a assessing the strength of a contract or whether it's you know, remembering to transfer money from their uh, savings account to their checking account before they pay bills, these are all sort of things that, that they're gonna have to struggle with. One of the challenges, especially in financial education, is so much of the time, and I mean, and this is, this is what, what we're all talking about is you know, overcoming, so much of the time, um, uh, our, our educational topics are segmented into, into specific silos. The kids learn about this, and then they learn about that, and then they learn about this, and, and you know, we're trying to, to overcome this or that thing. But, but personal finance um, is, is something that's it's messy, and it's emotional. Um, so you know, part, of, part of what we're doing and what we're trying to track the impact of is you know, what happens when uh, you put kids, you know, once again in this in the video game environment, into an, a messy and emotional situation and let them uh, perhaps fail there where it's a much safer environment rather than you know, actually making, making the mistakes ourselves. So. Thank you, Dean. So speaking of segments, John, what segment of your customer base does your financial wellness program in Hello Wallet best address? Me with the mic, I forgot to hold it up, sorry. Oh, thanks, Judy. The, um, we think about it uh, for all of our clients, all of our markets. Um, we don't have any specific segments because we believe that financial fitness, financial wellness is a whole life uh, uh, effort, that uh, everyone comes at it from a different place, and we have to, again, meet them where they are. Um, we, uh, we have built our platform around measuring uh, the customer perspective as opposed to basing it on uh, on our financials or on uh, profits or, or, or how many widgets, how many products we're selling. It's, it's, all, it's really all about what we're doing uh, to help our clients uh, deal with the situations that they face. And you know, I, wa I wanna go back to what the treasurer talked about around Community Reinvestment Act. There, there are not many uh, financial institutions that, that get outstandings, I know uh, our, our friends here have gotten outstanding CRA ratings along with us. We're the only large bank in the company, the country that has had eight straight outstanding CRA ratings. Um, and we don't get there by thinking about segments and delivering products to a segment and making sure that we're hitting numbers or we're gonna get so many loans in a low and moderate income community. We believe that if we are, if we are providing support to our consumers where they are, our customers where they are, helping them with their lives, helping them uh, understand uh, how to be a, a better uh, customer and achieving their goals, their financial goals, then, uh, then we're gonna be successful because they're, they're successful. So that's, that's we focus on, on less about segments and more about being a bank that is responsive to the specific needs of all of our clients. Great. Uh, the on a um, platform features real stories, mm -hmm. uh, Krista, that demonstrate specifically the differences that they've made in those individuals' lives. Have you done any research on a bigger scale to see if there's been any um, research to indicate that there have been changes made uh, mm -hmm. overall in the behavior on a greater scale? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I mentioned the the program that we had for our teammates and how we launched it with our with our financial wellness program. Um, we um, have taken that program out to our clients now and offer it at to our clients at at no profit to SunTrust. We do that because of the impact that it's had on our people. So um, one of the things that I find completely fascinating is the way that we've packaged it. It allows the the client to be the hero. So, you know, it is not a SunTrust program. It is, obviously we administer it, but it is Home Depot's program. It is Delta's program. Um, it's Waffle House's program. And so their companies get the benefit and therefore the halo when it comes to lower turnover and greater engagement and all those types of things. But um, a financially confident workforce means a financially confident company, a financially confident employer. 
And so one, a couple of the stats that we found were, um, were the number of people who were actually budgeting pre-program versus post was around 35%, and then post, it was in the 70s. The number of people who were saving for their retirement was around 68%, and after they've gone through the program, it's 98%. That's insane, and the and it's all because the program is structured to get you to change your behaviors and to reward you as you're going through it for changing those behaviors. So when we see numbers like that, we know that the behavior impact is is really changing lives. And you know, there's a that we we have a little hall of fame in our offices um, of all the different stories that have come our way. But one of our one of the ones that touched us incredibly was um, was from a client who said that she had been in an abusive relationship most of her life because of her finances, because she did not have the control that she needed over her money. And she said going through that program helped her to gain footing, to have the courage to leave with her children and put all of them in a better place. And so when you hear stories like that, um, you know, that's a great day at work. That's a reason to believe in our program. Great. To, with uh, practical money skills, what are some of the ways that technology uh, improves the delivery and ab allows you to measure your results? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think we, we do live in, in a really exciting age. And, and, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, <laughs> Well, I, I, I love the fact, I mean, online banking has, you know, brought so much, you know, ho hope to be possible. And, you know, whether it's, um, you know, I, I'm excited to say that, you know, as we're going through our educational resources and you start, you know, looking at it and you go, well, gosh, we probably don't really need to include anything in here about balancing a checkbook anymore, do we? I mean, this, <laughs> this really, it's not a necessary thing. It's not, this is no longer a necessary skill. So, um, so you know, whether it's something like that, I remember uh, last year, so a year ago, uh, or two years ago when, when we had uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Olympic Committee has their athlete career education uh, thing in, you know, in, in D.C. every two years. And, and one of the Olympians was asking as we were going through this, you know, you know trying to train them up on, you know, these are, the, these are better ways to, to interact with your own finances. And she said, um, she said, gosh, yeah, I don't, you know, we're, but I, I, I don't know, you know, where am I going to, you know, ha be able to, to divide up everything that I'm spending and actually figure out where it's going and, you know, <laughs> have I got good news for you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I assume you bank online. She said, yeah, yeah, of course. I said, you know, if you, if you actually, if you go on there, I'm almost guarantee you're going to be able to download this and, you know, separate it out. I said, and, you know, you're going to have to take it from there. You will have to take the next step and actually decide what your priorities are. But, you know, so much of the work uh, that you had to do in the past, so much of the of the labor has been taken out of it. So that's a really exciting thing. Um, yeah, I mean, so there there are great opportunities. Uh, you know, even just that the technology that's not designed to bring, um, you know, financial education, uh, but 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 that's bringing it home to us. Um, you know, in, in some of the other ways. I mean, obviously, you know, I, I think whether it's you know moving from. Uh, you know, printed materials to, you know, tablets and phones. I mean, um, you know, w one of the other, one of the other things that, that's always exciting, we go out and do, you know, a lot of, a lot of work with high school students. And typically one of the questions that I ask, um, you know, sort of getting a, getting a feel for the room is, you know, show of hands, how many people in here have a cell phone? Um, and almost without, without question, every hand in the room is going to go up. Um, with the kids, and then you say, "Well, you know, how many of you know your credit scores?" And depending on which school, you know, where where you are. Let's um, get that question here. Yeah. How <laughs> many of you here have a cell phone? Hands up. And how many? Okay, hands down. How many of you here know your credit score? Oh my goodness. That's good. Friendly audience. That's good. Very <laughs> good. That's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> Although I know those of you didn't raise your hand. We'll talk later. You guys, you guys are a lot better than the high school students we, we currently work with, which is good. Uh, you should be. Um, but so you know, there there are there are many different ways of of sort of you know getting these things across. And so you know, I mean, what, one of the things you were talking about, obviously, um, is is trying to trying to utilize those devices. So I mean, everybody you know has that cell phone in the pocket. Well, you know, what are the best ways to to utilize those devices? And so. 
Um, you know, w whether it's it's with something like the Ana program, whether it's with something like Hello Wallet, these are really exciting things that sort of you know bring it right home to your pockets. Now we do that, but from from you know because we're not a bank, we do that from uh, an educational standpoint. So um, all the games that we currently have, you know, these are these are things that you can actually you know download from the App Store, uh, interact with that way. And, and, and ultimately, it's about trying to make those things more exciting, more engaging, put them, make them more accessible, um, and, and you know, better uh, and, and more, more fun to do with. So. Thank you, Hugh. So, Don, moving forward, what are some of the things that you see as being variables that you would like to be able to capture and measure uh, with Hello Wallet or other financial literacy initiatives that you see Key Bank engaging in? Not just necessarily in financial capability, but I know that you do a lot in community development as you related to. Well, it's, 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 the, it's the same things that you've heard uh, from the rest of the, of the, of the panel. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter to us uh, how much we're selling. Yes, of course, we're, we're a for-profit corporation and our investors care, care very much that we're making money. But for us, especially given our market footprint, um, you know, we are, we're Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Cleveland, Toledo, Youngstown, Detroit, you know, it goes, uh, y you're looking at communities where, where there have been troubles uh, in the past, and there, there are probably more folks who are having financial issues than I think any of us would like. And for us, uh, investing in, uh, in these communities, using the Hello Wallet platform, as a means of helping people meet their goals is really critical. Um, so we're embedding everything that we're doing into our everyday interactions. So all of our banking professionals who interact on, on a daily basis, our retail teams, they know Hello Wallet. They use Hello Wallet. They help folks work through Hello Wallet. Every time you call in to, uh, to Key or every time you go online at Key, there's Hello Wallet, it pops up. So it's really trying to drive utilization, the adaptive assessment uh, that was talked about earlier, uh, really drive that. And so we believe that it's, uh, sure, we're gonna, we have metrics for everything, but at the end of the day, it's, it's what are we doing to help people get where they wanna go? And I'm gonna give one example. So uh, just as we were getting Hello Wallet started, uh, a young woman uh, who was just going through a divorce uh, had two young kids, came to one of our bankers in, uh, in uh, upstate New York and said, I want to buy a house, getting out of this marriage, I want to have a, place, a safe place for my kids. And she said, uh, can you help me get a, get a, get a mortgage? And th this was just a, a, she came right into a branch to do this. And the banker said, well, let's, let's work on your financial goals, let's see what you have. It turned out that she had a 470 credit score. Now, we're not going to be able to provide uh, a mortgage to someone that day uh, with a 470 credit score, but she said, let's work on your financial goals. Let's see if we can put you in a place where in a short, shorter period of time than you think, we can get you to a place where you're in a home and you're building for your financial future. Well, a year later, after some work, she... Uh, enrolled in Hello Wallet or, or had her information in Hello Wallet. She worked on uh, understanding her financial fitness on a daily basis. She had help from her personal banker. Uh, she got to a place where her credit score was 700 and she, uh, she was able to buy a home and move into it. And then she referred 10 other people mm -hmm. to come in and, and get loans, uh, get mortgages with us. So again, we're in it we think that we measure it by, based on our ability to help people get where they need to go and less about the, I mean, we have a, a, a ream of data, all, all of these companies, you have to have the data to back up what you're doing. But at the end of the day, if we're building communities that are successful and clients who, have, who uh, are financially fit and are reaching their goals, then we're gonna make money. That's, that's gonna happen at the end of the day. It's, it's more about being very client-centric. Centric. Centric, jeez, man, my brain. Okay. Client centric, Talk thank in. you. Use your mic, that's yeah. more than I've been yeah. able to do. <laughs> Go ahead, it's still winning. Um, Krista, how would uh, you define um, success 
uh, you've given great examples and definitely a great day. Uh, that story was, was mm -hmm. great. But how would you measure success on a metric scale for the ANA program? Um, you know, we're, we're working on how that program gets expanded to the, to the rest of the world. Um, we've created some programs. We have the on up challenge on onup.com, which is, which uses the core tenets from our, from our wellness program, momentum on up and allows people to self guide themselves as well. But one of the things we announced 10 days ago, two weeks ago is a financial confidence index. Um, we talked a little bit about data. The difference with, with this index versus other indices is it does focus on behavior. And so, um, you know, when you're financially stressed, you don't enjoy your life. You're not freed up to enjoy the moments that matter. And so if we can identify, and we have through this work, um, traits of financially competent people, then we can help people even faster on that same sort of plane of behavior change. Um, you know, I, I have to believe at the beginning of this, when you heard all of our resumes and you heard mine, you were going, wait a minute, this does not sound quite... <laughs> like theirs and, and quite as uh, relevant. But there's a reason why this activity and the other activities that I lead are together. And Don said it a couple of times. You have to meet people where they are. And a lot of, um, a lot of our partnerships opportunities expose us to a great number of people. Um, so we create financial confidence programs at SunTrust Park with the Atlanta Braves and at the Ryman Auditorium, because people don't walk in there to say, hey, let's talk about my money, but they do walk in with their family, and if we can expose them to it in a way that's fun and engaging, then maybe it can spark that conversation for them to talk to us more later or talk to someone about their financial confidence later. So, you know, financial stress crosses every socioeconomic age, gender, every demographic you can come up with. Um, the Financial Confidence Index is a good sample of all of those different groups for us. But if we can break it down to some key behaviors, which we're in the process of doing, um, then we can help more people faster. Hugh, what um, ha are you currently not measuring that you think would be helpful to measure looking forward? You talked a lot about the advances through technology and the wonders that it has allowed consumers, but in terms of what are you not capturing that you think would be important to capture moving forward? Well, I mean, I, I, I think we can we can all do, you know, a, a better job in um, tracking the, the true impact. Um, and I mean, I, I think, you know, ultimately, I, I know that's probably the sort of chief obvious answer, but it, but it is the obvious answer. I mean, that's, that I think will remain difficult. Now, and, and that's not to say that, um, you know, from you know whether whether we're talking the, the folks up here on the stage or you know a couple weeks ago, um, you know they had the Cherry Blossom Financial Institute uh, you know here in D.C. and you know it was just all talking about you know it was uh, researchers and and, uh, and acad academics talking about you know what actually works and these are all based off of you know studies that they were doing and they were reading papers and about 90% of it went over my head but what I caught was that financial education works, um, but you know I I think. Yeah, I would almost I would I would swing back and take a small issue with something you said before where you're talking about um, I knew you would <laughs> where you were talking about, you know, there's there's no need for, for new programs. And I would argue with that. I, I, I don't necessarily know that that's true. I mean part of I mean, you know, the, the theme that we were talking about here today is you have to meet people where they are. Not everyone responds the same way to the same things. And and something that, that you know, gosh, really seems like it should be you know, tailored for everyone and, and, you know, should should meet everyone, you know, might not be the right thing for that specific person. And, and I think the great thing about having a lot of programs out there is the fact that, that there's a lot of choice and, and the resources are available for people um, where, you know, where they're looking for it. I, I also think that we could do a much better job of and, and I know, and I'm, I'm certainly not the first person to say this, but, but of Changing our idea of you know what what does success look like? Um, I mean, I, I think that certainly for me, you know, we I, I get into a mindset where 
there are specific metrics that must be met for someone to feel as if they've you know, uh, the checked the box for now they're financially capable, now they've achieved financial success. And, and what looks like success for me may not look like success to them. And we have to let people set their own priorities. Just because that student decides, just because I think it's silly to go out and spend money on a PS4 does not mean that for a student who has budgeted for it, who has saved for it, and who's planned for that expense, I don't get to judge the fact that, that that's what, you know, that's success to them and that's what they want to spend their money on. Like that's, you know, that, that, that's as long as they understand the impact of that decision and where else that money could have gone and all that and, and they're still making that decision, well, that's great. I mean, you know, that, you know, they, they get to do that. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, think, I think we could do, you know, a better job maybe tracking impact with that in mind, that, that it's not a one size fits all. Well, since you call me out, okay. you know I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> Uh, what I meant by that comment was I don't think that you need to have more n new programs that are on the same topic, on the same subject. Duplicative efforts, we do not need to have another program because somebody's ego needs to be massaged and have a new program on how to open a checking account because they need to have their logo on it. <laughs> That's what I was referring to. And we don't need to have yet another program on... Um, how to open a retirement account because another company needs to see their logo on that. They are literally thousands of programs on how to open a checking account, open an online checking account, and how to open up a retirement account. Multiple sure. programs. And that's what I meant by that sure. comment. Right. So I'm happy to have this further online discussion, <laughs> <laughs> discussion off, off the table, but that's what I meant. Sure. I mean, I don't disagree that one size doesn't fit all. I, d I don't disagree that yeah. practitioners shouldn't become judgy in their uh, definition of success or what <coughs> is right for one person is not right for everybody else. I'm, I was referring to duplicate efforts sure. on the same type of program. Um, I just know that I've run across multiple top uh, programs on the same topic yeah. with just a different logo on there. Okay. And that's what I was talking about because sure. those monies could be better spent being directed at research or development Definitely. of other uh, in other areas. So just for the record, um, you knew I wouldn't let it go. Um, so that concludes our portion. If anyone has any questions for the panel or myself, we'll wait one second, please. We have mic runners, uh, and we just have time for a couple of questions. And I see a hand up here, uh, and here is Tracy running. So I have two questions, one for the whole panel and then one specifically wow. for okay. Don. Um, when we talk about entrepreneurs, you acquire money for when you're a young person, even adults who don't understand financing. People acquire money for a car, for a house, for stuff. But when it comes to a business, people think, well, I need to do a nonprofit or I need to do an SBA loan. Um, when you were talking about creatively and thinking outside the box, how do you change that dynamic? Because if you do the standard procedures to acquire money, which is credit and a job, then someone who has a, has a concept of thinking outside the box wouldn't know which direction. So what are you doing to attract those kind of people? Uh, because if they say, well, I acquire it through my credit, well, they could do a BK or they could do an LLC or an S corporation to get out of those problems. Um, for example, for someone who has a, a felon, or someone that has something that really is bad on their life that they can't make a correction. So, you know, I always tell them, do OPM, do other people's money. Uh, uh, start, no, you really think, you got to think very creative. Online uh, is doing amazing right now. I know people have just an Instagram account making $30,000 a month on selling stuff on Instagram or companies like Wish. Uh, my second question is for Don. Don, you talk about Hello Wallet. How do you compete with Mint.com, and how do you compete with... Uh, LearnVest and Key, uh, KeyBank because I know Mint.com and some of those apps are so complex that to try to condense and put all that information into an app and if a person's not tech savvy they're just not going to catch that. Well, I'll, I'll take the, the second question first and then maybe we'll let's see who, who wants to go after uh, answer your, your first question. Um, we think that we're unique 
uh, among a, a lot of banks. There, there are not many, uh, many banks of, of our size and scale that have the depth and breadth of our product offerings as well as having this platform. So for us, it's, it's building the financial wellness through Hello Wallet into our everyday interactions with our clients so that um, you know, whether you're, you're someone who doesn't have, uh, uh, is not uh, financially literate, uh, is trying to learn how to get, you know, start a business or uh, get a student loan or, or buy a house, we'll meet the person where they are and they can use, our, use Hello Wallet as one of the tools in the arsenal for learning to how, how to be a, a more financially fit person. They input their, their goals into our system. We can, we can do it for them or they can do it themselves if they're tech savvy. Um, and, and so it's really about, uh, about building a long-term relationship because there's, frankly, trust is, the, is one of the biggest issues. And if you don't have trust in an app, in a relationship with a financial service provider, you're going to go to the places where you normally go or where you see in your, in your neighborhood. As a, a lot of folks, uh, we've seen this in, in, in a number of low-income communities, there's a check casher there and there's no, there's no bank branch. It's harder physically to get across town to get to a bank branch that may not be open at that time. It's harder to go into a place that, where people don't necessarily look like you uh, so part of what we're trying to do is, again, meet people where they are. We're going to have branches in your community. We're going to be out in the community uh, doing our, our uh, financial literacy uh, and financial fitness training programs, Learn and Earn. Uh, we have Hello Wallet, so you can do it online. Um, and we're looking at partnerships for folks that are not at a point where they can even begin to have a uh, relationship with a financial services uh, company where they can interact with us. Uh, there's some really great uh, uh, companies out there uh, uh, like uh, Mobility Capital Finance, Mocafi, uh, which is helping folks who typically go to ch check cashers uh, have a, 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 a financial relationship. So that's the sort of thing that I think we, we're going to compete with the mints of the world just fine because we're, we're looking at it from, from a much broader perspective, a holistic perspective, meeting people with a whole range of products and services. So. I think you went into that first question too and that answer there. So, um, and, and I think we're very similar too. We're looking for partnerships. We've got a very robust partnership with Operation Hope and Hope Inside programs through some, some great work we do with John Hope Bryant and his team. Um, we're also, you know, because financial confidence is so critical to, to the success of our company, we're also looking at different formats to help people. Um, so we've got a, a couple mobile programs. We had one last year. We're about to launch a second one. Um, we also have a different format that we're putting in places. Like at SunTrust Park, there is an on-up experience. And it's just about uh, engaging you at a very simple level around financial confidence. We have a similar one in, in Memphis, a financial confidence center that was part of the um, Crosstown rebuild, if, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, and so we're, we're trying to stay creative and stay relevant, but you know, I don't want to underscore the importance of digital and mobile. That, that is the preferred way for most people regardless of, of age or, um, or or any sort of other demographic. That's where they are getting their information. And so we're trying to make sure right now we don't have an ONUP app, but ONUP is you know mobile friendly. So we're looking at that as well. Yeah, and I, I would just say that, um, you know, I mean, I, I think especially the growth of the sort of person to person economy the you know uh, the the opportunities that are out there, especially because of all the technological advances that have happened, but the the opportunities that are out there for uh, small and micro businesses have have never been better at this point. Now, so I mean, we our, our program we don't provide financial advice; we provide you know financial education. But I would just say that I mean, sort of no no matter no matter what, you know, if you're talking to a retiree or a high school student, you know uh, you know the, all the the difference. The, the only difference is, is not in the principle, it's in, you know, sort of the, the execution. And the principles remain the same, that, you know, you, you should be attempting to, to spend less than you earn, 
you should be, you know, have a plan, have a goal, you know, n know how to get there. I mean, I, so I mean, I think all the principles are the same. It just, it comes down to the execution of it. But. We have time for just one more question, but I believe that the panelists will be, it's, I really, I'm impressed. You guys have stayed and we're running over, so thank you so much. Uh, but we have time for one more uh, question. Um, and uh, he asked, I don't know who that guy is, but he asked first. <laughs> I know you, but Tom I Tom Rosenfield, yeah. thank you. Um, I haven't heard any discussion and wondering whether gender lens investing, diversity types of issues are important, particularly since three very large banks or financial organizations are talking about a lot of education at the um, school age and young adult um, side of life. Does it, does it play a role, particularly in education? For any of you guys, I'm, with the with the, uh, with the emergency sirens. vehicle, we missed the first part of your oh. question. Gender gender lens investing or diversity issues from the standpoint of uh, more of a I'll call traditional uh, definition of gender lens investing in terms of focusing on process rather than outcome. I'll start, and then hopefully my colleague here will bail me out. Um, uh, we, we actually uh, have a, uh, a pro, uh, uh, an initiative that we, we'd we had in place for many years, this is just a, one example, uh, that we recently restarted uh, called Key for Women. We know that, uh, that, uh, that every individual comes at financial issues with a very different perspective. Uh, and in the past, many financial institutions uh, had built a one-size-fits-all, not our institutions, a one-size-fits-all approach to dealing with uh, their clients, and they typically were more oriented, more oriented towards men. Uh, and we uh, have, have taken a very conscientious approach of building key for women to specifically meet the needs of women uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, often, you know, it, it's, it's folks who are, uh, who are widowed, uh, and are dealing with uh, the whole range of issues that they have to deal with in uh, getting their arms around their, their financial uh, uh, wellness. It's uh, women who are trying to start new businesses. Uh, it's women who are the, the uh, sole earners in, in, their, in their families and have young children. So we, we're, again, this is just one example of the type of thing that we're doing, but we're very uh, focused on trying to meet, again, meet people where they are and recognizing that every, per, every one of our clients is going to be very different. Um, yeah, I, I, I apologize if it sounded like we were focusing more on school age because I think we're, I think all of us have programs that are much broader than that. Um, we have, we have leaned on our teammates. Um, we have formed networks within our within our teammate groups. So we have um, a very active diversity and inclusion network. We have a very active women's network. Um, and those groups are tackling some of the helping us learn more about how to build our systems and our, and our process to support that. There are some very unique needs when you start looking at an LBG, LGBT community. There are some very unique needs when you start looking at women as it relates to to wealth clients. Um, and so we have, we have leaned on our teammates heavily. We've done tons of research. I'm sure we all have and we all have access to that. But we've leaned on our teammates to help us a lot, do a lot of designing of that. Uh, you know, I, I have to say one of the things that surprised me the most um, leading the On It movement for SunTrust was um, how much people tend to focus on helping the low to moderate income instead of all ranges of it. One of the best stories that I have was one of our private wealth advisors who came to me very shortly after the launch and said, okay, I didn't buy this at first. I didn't think it was for my clients, but I was wrong because a client of his had the courage after being exposed to the on it movement to reach out to him and say, I need you to help me with my financial confidence. And his advisor was thinking, I know what you have. You are really confident. And he said, what you don't know is I have a child who's an addict, and I'm terrified that my money will kill him. Help me become financially confident by helping me protect him from the means that he has access to. And that was just, you know, that was mind-blowing to us. So we, we definitely, you know, there's obviously a lot of language things we're working on, too, to make sure it translates, but we definitely look at the full spectrum. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you.
So I know we're over. We do just have one off agenda item, and it should be a fairly quick presentation. But I want to welcome the president of Junior Achievement USA, Jack Kosakowski, to the stage. Thanks, Anthony. I will make this quick. I'm kind of the dessert. We had a pretty <laughs> hefty dinner here, so uh, I'll finish up very lightly. Uh, and just mention that, you know, we don't just get together in Washington to admire problems. We actually have people that go out and do stuff. And so uh, going back to 2003, uh, the Office of Civic Engagement and Volunteerism at the White House uh, created this Volunteer Service Award. And in 2006, Junior Achievement USA was authorized to be presenting these awards. And so I'm very pleased uh, to be here today to present to the Financial Services Roundtable a Gold Leadership Award, which is the top level of the three. Uh, we have a quarter of a million volunteers going into schools every year, and the Financial Services Roundtable uh, section of that is over 30,000 volunteers going into school. So uh, I want to just present this award while we are amongst friends here and our good friends at the Financial Services Roundtable. That concludes